My name is Brother John, motivational storyteller, cultural historian, tribute vocalist. I want to welcome you to the program, The Underground Railroad, or UGRR. The who, what, and where did it go? And today we're going to explore the basic elements of the most powerful clandestine secret movement in these here United States that helped African Americans who were in slavery to be free or help gain their freedom. Many individuals, many ethnic groups helped for the fight for freedom in this country. And it's still going on. First, uh, let us uh, define what is the Underground Railroad. Now, the Underground Railroad was a secret movement. I use that word clandestine. Clandestine simply means secret or hidden away. And uh, it was any ways that the enslaved would use to gain their freedom. This is a, uh, a basic, uh, this is a map of the United States and Canada and Mexico, and it's kind of a basic uh, documentation of some of the, the basic routes, some of the routes, a few routes that were used that individuals, fugitives, helped gain their freedom. As you can see, this is Missouri right here. All the dark states were the slave states, slaves, the states in which slavery existed. The light-colored areas right here were the, uh, the free states. Uh, slavery was not uh, a practice, even though there were some situations that uh, kind of, uh, there was things going on. However, the major territories out west here, that slavery was permitted, though less, in there, it, though less it was uh, not, there were not slave uh, territories or slaves there. Now, the winds, you can barely see the arrows here is where the major routes they escaped. Uh, one basic area right here from Missouri, they escaped over into Kansas, which was a free state. These areas over here I mentioned were in the free area, free territories. Escaped from Kansas into Quindaro. We're going to be discussing that a little bit uh, later. Over into Iowa, Minnesota, Illinois, across the Mississippi River. Individuals, fugitives used to escape to their freedom to the free lands as well. Um, also, here's a kind of a map right here about the state of Missouri. The darkened areas is where the highest percentage of slave of, of, of farms that were things that were going on, plantations and farms that the slave activities was going here. They call this area Little Dixie. Here is Kansas City and Platte County was one of the largest, one of the counties that had the most of slave holding activity that was going on right here in this particular state. Now, when we talk about Slavery, what is slavery? Let's define that. Slavery, a definition is the act and system of one individual or people considered by law as property or chattel and deprived, denied the free human rights held by free citizens. As you can see here in this uh, poster over here, from the 16th to the 19th centuries, from the late 1500s to the uh, to the mid-1800s here, the transatlantic slave trade, of course, uh, slave trade uh, in, the, in the early 1800s was abolished, but still, uh, slavery continued on until 1865, right after the Civil War. But from the 16th to the 19th centuries, the transatlantic slave trade sends over 50 million Africans to the New World. Some estimate it's as low as 12 million. But uh, 50 million, it could be up to there, and maybe even more. But Africans, Individuals were taken from their homelands in the motherland, snatched away, placed in chains. Businesses and families were uprooted and placed on boats across the Atlantic Ocean to be sailed to North America, uh, um, the South America, and to the Caribbean. Did you know that uh, as a slave, at one time you were considered a piece of property? was amended in the United States Constitution that African slaves were considered three-fifths of a human being. 
1755, all 13 colonies recognized chattel slavery as the law. 1770, slave labor became vital to southern economy in the growing rice, tobacco, cotton, and sugar cane, and amongst other crops. In 1786, one of the earliest slave documents documented escapes is when the Quakers uh, ate runaways from the state of Virginia. 1794, Canada, Canada had passed its anti-slavery law that slavery was illegal in 1793. In 1830, the rise in popularity of the Underground Railroad, or the train, the imagery uh, that described and dis the, the movement of escaping slaves. Hence, we have Underground Railroad. Uh, in the 1848, the first Women's Rights Convention held in Seneca Falls, New York. Women's rights and abolitionist movements joined forces together. In 1858, on, the Jekyll, on Jekyll Isle, the slave ship Wanderer arrives, carrying what may have been the last cargo of fugitive slaves to these here United States, the Western world. Now, we, uh, we had a definition about what was slavery. There are two types of slavery, basically. Basic two types of slavery. One was indentured servitude. Now, indentured servitude can found all uh, it's been going on for thousands and thousands of years. You can find indentured servitude. I remember an example in the Bible with Jacob and his uncle Laban. What he, an individual will work off a certain period of time for their freedom. And a lot of times they were given provisions, resources, or money to be able, after they got their free, they basically work off their, uh, their time that was served there and gain their freedom. Uh, and for thousands of years, people, even in Africa, would uh, capture other slaves, uh, other individuals of families there, and put them in indentured servitude. After that time was used, utilized, they will actually become be completely free. A lot of individuals actually were used, uh, were treated as family members as well in the slave economy, in the, the slave way of indentured servitude. I think of an individual also was a free African American in Missouri here prior to the Civil War. His name was Hiram Young. He, at that one time, he was one of the richest African American men, businessmen in the state, in, in Jackson County, in, in Independence. He had a yoke uh, making business there. And Hiram would had endangered servants. And they would work off their freedom they work off their time as well, and then he'll set them free, giving them also resources and money. So indentured servitude. A lot of individuals, actually Native Americans, escaped from their freedom and went to the Native American uh, tribes and, and people. A lot of them became family members and intermingled and, 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 and married within them, were treated as family as well. Now the other type of slavery, we had indentured servant. The other type of servitude uh, of, of slavery is, um, Chattel slavery. Chattel slavery is where you were captured, treated like livestock, like an animal, against your will. And uh, you were, uh, a lot of individuals were treated harshly. A lot of them were treated, uh, uh, well, I'm going to tell you this. Uh, perhaps your family pet were treated better than uh, a chattel slave. A lot of individuals who were in chattel slavery were treated uh, pretty well of civil. A lot were not. You were beaten against your will. You were not allowed to even vote or wake up or go to sleep until you get permission from your slave master. That's the way it was. It was against the law to even think about wanting to go to school uh, or, or, or learn how to read, indeed. So that was chattel slavery, a much different type of slavery, indeed, from indentured servitude. Now, uh, what was the value placed on the enslaved fugitive African Americans? Well, first of all, the, the slavery was an economic machine, an industry that was practiced in these here United States. And the value placed on enslaved fugitives, as you can see, the reward signs. Where you're basically treated as a piece of property, like a, a lawnmower or, or, or any type of a, a, a household appliance. Uh, uh, th that's what you were as a human being, as basically I call it a human machine. Uh, a slave is a human machine with no civil rights whatsoever. The value placed upon them, uh, I have this little chart here that we have, uh, have gained here from the, uh, uh, from this, uh, uh, 
that actually states the type of, um, of the, den the dollar denomination of the value, just how much the value that was placed upon human machine. Uh, in 1860, you were valued at, a slate was uh, the, the general value at $200. Today, if in 2022, today, uh, $6,697 and some change, and much of that value were placed upon that. An individual, $800 was worth, say, $26,790 and some change, 17 cents and some change here. That's how much the value of that person was. They put you on their tax rolls. You were treated and just, you, you, you were not even allowed to get married so much as well, uh, or on the rolls as a, treated as a human being. That's what a chattel slave was. You were a piece of property. Uh, to show you a little more about the economy, uh, at 1860, it was estimated that 4 million individuals were slaves. African Americans were slaves. And the average was well, $1,000 a piece, say, that would come up to around $4 billion worth of human machines. And it equaled up by today's standard as a $42 trillion industry. $42 trillion with the T. That's how much of the value that was placed upon uh, the enslaved fugitives uh, treated as human machines. <clears throat> I say goodbye to the land I stand. And cross on over to the promised land. I shout for joy at freedom's best. And drop old slavery, give my soul love. Rest. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 and the revised Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 gave slave traders, or bounty hunters, the legal right to capture fugitive slaves and even free African Americans. Uh, as you can see right here, one story that's, that's very prominent, uh, talk about a free man, Solomon Northrop. They uh, made a movie a few uh, years ago, a motion picture, and also based upon the book, 12 Years as a Slave. He was a free man sold into slavery, never touched a day in his life. And there were many African Americans who were free. Uh, so bounty hunters will come in many different disguises, and they gave them the legal rights to go to many different cities, free places, free towns, uh, territories, uh, to actually capture individuals, whether they were enslaved or what, and bring them to back to their slave master or to a slave-holding territory, a slave-holding uh, of uh, position or of, of uh, uh, owner. Uh, Solomon's story, though, he was an artist. He was a musician, and uh, the bounty hunters were posing as music uh, agents, uh, representatives, promoters as well. And the streak was poisoned, and he went, uh, he was then captured and taken and had to fight to get and gain his freedom. And so uh, there were many signs that were around. Caution. We have hereby respectively caution and advise to avoid conversing with watchmen and the police officers of Boston since the order that they're empowered to act as slave catchers or kidnappers. So you had to be able to keep a sharp eye who to trust you because they could actually uh, have a price upon your head even though you're free. You had to be careful even though you escape to your freedom as a fugitive, you can be actually be captured to be taken back. Uh, there was also of a kind of a, a dark side to, there were some African Americans who actually were working undercover as bounty hunters and uh, capturing their own friends or family and selling them into slavery. Uh, that's what we get the term, you were sold down the river. That term means as well, uh, you were sold and uh, down towards the, the southern states where the harshest, of, the harshest of experiences of slavery took place in Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, uh, and, the, uh, and, and points of, on, in, in that area as well, sold down the river. But since the uh, first Africans were captured and taken from their homeland, and these individuals in the motherland were business people, family members, free citizens. And they have, there have always been revolts and the fight against the enslavement. Now, 
for thousands of years, individuals have captured slaves. Uh, uh, that's one of the, the spoils of war. And like we mentioned earlier about the indentured servant to uh, action that was taken. Uh, a lot of ones were treated very civil. Uh, but the story that a lot of chiefs, of African chiefs, sold out one tribe or another to European slave traders uh, was a misconception. Uh, that's if uh, they thought that they were actually being sold into indentured servitude. That's what they thought they were, not chattel slavery. Uh, because chattel was not uh, primarily in their conscious cultural mindset. But since African citizens were kidnapped, uh, there have been dozens of slave revolts for their freedom by any means necessary. Now let's examine two uh, 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 couple of prominent examples of that. The slave ship Amistad, which there was a motion picture several years back uh, documenting this particular story that was portrayed. The story began in February 1839 when Portuguese slave hunters abducted hundreds of Africans from Mendelin in present-day Sierra Leone and transported them to Cuba, at that time was a Spanish colony. Though the United States, Britain, Spain, and other European powers had abolished the importation of slaves by that time, the slave trade was, uh, was ended for transporting slaves from Africa to the, to the Western world. The transatlantic slave trade still continually to operate illegally. And Havana in Cuba was an important slave trading hub. Several days into the journey, one of the Africans, uh, known him as Joseph Sinke, managed to unshackle himself and his fellow captives. And armed with knives, they seized control of the Amistad, the ship the Amistad, killing its Spanish captain, the ship's cook, who had taught it the captives by telling them that they would be killed and eaten if you got on a plantation. Well, the need for navigation, the Africans ordered Montez and Rez, the, the ship's commanding officers, to turn the ship eastward back to Africa. But the Spaniards secretly changed course at night, and instead the Amistad sailed through the Caribbean up the eastern coast of the United States. And on August 26, the U.S. Brigadier Washington found the ship while it was anchored off the tip of Long Island to get provisions. The naval officers seized the Amistad and put the Africans back in chains, escorting them to Connecticut, where they would claim salvage to the ship and its human cargo. They were charged with murder and piracy. Sinke and the other Africans and the Amistad were imprisoned in New Haven. And though the criminal charges were quickly dropped, they remained in prison while the courts went back to citing their legal status, as well as the competing property claims by the officers of the Washington, Montez and Ruiz, and the Spanish government. While President Martin Van Buren sought to extradite the Africans to Cuba to pacify Spain, a group of abolitionists in the North, led by Louis Tappan, Reverend Joseph Levitt, and Reverend Simeon Joycelyn, raised money for their legal defense. I call them underground railroad of conductors, secret agents. And they argued that they had been, these Africans had been legally captured and imported as slaves. Former president and defense attorney John Quincy Adams, in the lengthy argument beginning on February 24th, Argens Adams accused Van Buren of abusing his executive powers and defended the Africans' right to fight for their freedom aboard the Amistad. And at the heart of the case, Adams argued, as was the willingness of the United States to stand up for their ideals, which it was founded. The moment you come to the Declaration of Independence, that every man has a right to life and liberty and an inalienable right, this case is decided. Adams said, I ask nothing more in behalf of these unfortunate men than this declaration. However, on March 9th, 1841, March 9th, the Supreme Court ruled 7 to 1 to uphold the lower court's decision in favor of the Africans in the Amistad. Justice Joseph Story delivered the majority opinion, writing that there does not seem to us to be any ground for doubt that these Negroes ought to be deemed free. But the court did not require the government to provide funds to return the Africans to their homeland and awarded salvage rights for the ship to the United States Naval officers who apprehended it. 
After Van Bruen's successor, John Tyler, President Tyler refused to pay for reparations, abolitionists again raised funds in November 1841. And that's when Sinke and the other surviving Africans of the Amistad sailed from New York aboard the ship Gentlemen, accompanied by several Christian missionaries to return to their homeland of Africa. However, there was another one. The Igbo Landing Mass Suicide in 1803 is one of the largest mass suicides of enslaved people. While Igbo captives for what is now Nigeria, the African country of Nigeria, were taken to the Georgia coast. In May 1803, the Igbo and other West African captives arrived in Savannah, Georgia, and on the slave ship Wanderer. They were purchased for an average of $100 each by slave merchants and to be resold in plantations on nearby Simmons Island. The chained slaves were packed under a deck of, of coastal vessel of the York, which was to take to St. Demians. And during the voyage, 75 Igbo slaves rose up in a rebellion and took control of the ship, drowned their captors, and in the process caused the grounding of the ship in Dunbar Creek. The sequence of events that occurred next remains unclear. It is known only that the Igbo marched ashore, singing led by their high chief. Then at his direction, they walked into the marshy waters of Dunbar Creek, committing a mass suicide. Roswell King, a white overseer on the nearby Pierce Butler Plantation, wrote that the first account of this event, and he, another man identified as Captain Patterson, recovered many of the drowned bodies. Apparently, only a subset of the 75 Igbo rebels remained while they were drowned. Regardless of the numbers, the death signaled a powerful story of resistance as these captures overwhelmed their captors in a strange land, and many took their own lives rather to be enslaved in the New World. The mutiny and suspicious suicide by the Igbo people was called by many locals the first freedom march in the history of the United States. The story of Igbo, who chose death over slavery, which had long been part of folklore, was finally recorded from various oral sources in the 1930s by the Gullah Island inhabitants and members of the Federal Writers project. Enslaved men and women killed themselves for a number of different reasons. Many weren't able to cope with the long, arduous, and traumatic journey. Many of them had also had died. They were involved in regular beatings. Some hoped that death would take them back to Africa. William Snellgrave, an unapologetic English slave trader, claimed that Africans believed if they were to be put to death, they shall reign again in their country. Committing suicide was indeed considered an act of rebellion by many. Some enslaved men and women refused to eat, hoping to starve themselves to death. Leaping overboard was another means of escape. This tactic was not as easy as it may seem because many slave ships had nettings surrounding the boat. One of the individuals had, had actually had said that uh, if uh, I would have jumped if the netting was not there, risking myself to be ate by whatever beans or sharks or whatever. But enslaved Africans aboard some ships managed to get hold of knives and swords and even guns and gunpowder. And those who did not turn these weapons on the crew sometimes used them again to commit suicide. And these documented cases of slave Africans of hurting themselves and along with their captains occurred on many uprisings like the new Britannia ship in 1773. Go down, Moses, ray down in Egypt land. Hello, Pharaoh, to let my people go. There are many individuals who are key contributors to the Underground Railroad, the secret clandestine way of gaining your, uh, your freedom as a fugitive. 
I consider these individuals who risk their lives because if you were to ever think about rescuing someone as a fugitive, you risk your own life of being in jail and imprisoned or even put to death. I consider these individuals secret agents of the UGRR. One of them was Isaac Hopper, and he was a Quaker who played a, a role in the formation of the Underground Railroad. One was an individual by the name of John Brown, and many individuals know that John Brown, uh, he harbored runaway fugitives at his home and a warehouse and established an anti-slave catcher militia following the 1850 passage of the Fugitive Slave Act to fight against that. And with several of his sons, he participated in the so-called Bleeding Kansas conflict with a raid in 1856 that resulted in the murder of five pro-slavery settlers. Another raid in December 1858 freed 11 slaves from three Missouri plantations, after which Brown took his hotly pursued charges on a nearly 1,500-mile journey all the way up to the free lands of Canada. Becoming even more radicalized, Brown took his final action in 1859 when he and 21 followers seized a federal armory in Harper's Ferry, Virginia, now West Virginia, an attempt to foment a large-scale slave rebellion against the tyranny of slavery in the United States. However, unfortunately, he was caught and quickly convicted and hanged that December. Harriet Tubman, born in Maryland, she was considered an individual that rescued nearly 300 slaves, fugitives. She was a fugitive herself. She said, I freed hundreds of slaves. I could have freed thousands more if only they knew that they were in slavery. So you got to think about being free before you actually make the action of being free. Because she said she never lost a package, code name, a fugitive, anyone. And she carried a gun, not only for her own protection, but if anybody will make the, one of the excuse of running back and risking getting captured, they become a prisoner of war. And then, as a prisoner of war, you could give up the information where the others were. She disguised herself many times even as a man to gain her freedom. And she continued her anti-slavery activities during the Civil War as serving as a scout, a spy, and a nurse for the United States Army, the Union Army, and even reported becoming the first U.S. woman to lead troops into battle. Thomas Garrett, uh, he was said to have aided 2,750 fugitives prior before the break of the Civil War. William Steele, Individual we know as uh, the documented was called the father of the Underground Railroad, who documented many individuals who came to his house and uh, learned of their stories. Uh, Levi Coffin, known as the president of the Underground Railroad, and he purportedly became an abolitionist at the age of seven years old, a little boy, when he witnessed the column of chained slaves being driven to the auction block. Yeah chattel slaves, getting his start bringing food to fugitives, hiding out on his family's North Carolina farm. And he would grow to be a prosperous merchant and a, a very prolific station master. That was an individual who ran a secret house or school or place that you would hide the fugitives as they made their journey up to the free lands. Operating openly, Coffin even hosted anti-slavery lectures and abolitionists of meetings and like his fellow Quaker Thomas Garrett remained defiant and when dragged into court, arrested and dragged into court, he quoted, he stated, and I quote, the dictates of humanity came in opposition to the law of the land and we ignored this law. Another man by the name of Elijah Anderson uh, which marked the border between free and, and, and slave states was known in abolitionist circles as the River Jordan, the Ohio River. And for slaves on the farm, Madison, Indiana served as one particular attractive crossing point thanks to the Underground Railroad cell that was set up by the blacksmith Elijah Anderson. Many individuals were business people, men and women and children that helped become Underground Railroad secret agents. There was a man by the name of Samuel Burse who went to prison. He was a free man 
and actually was arrested for transporting fugitives in his carriage cab. It's like today if you were driving an Uber or a Lyft or rideshare and you had fugitives that you were taking to, to, get, to gain their freedom and you were captured and arrested. Spent 15 months in jail awaiting his sentence and his sentence was to be sold into slavery. However, with the help of Underground Railroad Network uh, secret agents, they got together the money and they posed as, as slave buyers. He was being auctioned off, but they had the highest bid and they helped gain his freedom. They bought his freedom and returned him back to the life of freedom that he experienced there. Many individuals like Peg Leg Joe was a guy, a man, an individual who had one good leg and one peg leg. And he would walk to many different places and uh, hire himself out as a servant. But he'll go around and sneak and ask the, the workers, you want your freedom? You want your freedom? I'll, help, I'll get your freedom as well. And what he would do is he would teach them a song, follow the drinking gourd. Now the drinking gourd was a pot like fruit that hung on the vines there and they, were, they come in many various different sizes. You could get them around on the markets, especially around the harvest time there. And you could cut a hole in it and, and uh, bring out all the guts and then seeds and let it dry and it becomes a drinking apparatus, a tool. It was also another name for the Big Dipper, the constellation of Big Dipper. You follow the tail, it will point to the North Star. The North Star, the North Star was the fixed astronomical point north in the northern hemisphere, they were pointing. And many individuals, as you were, uh, uh, if you were a fugitive, didn't have a map. There were no Googles, no GPS. You just relied upon the stars, like for thousands of years, many individuals did. And the North Star was the star, the star that pointed to the northern hemisphere. The northern areas were for free, and also in Canada. When the sun goes back, those were the directions you followed. And the first quail calls, follow the drinking gourd. The old man is waiting to carry you to freedom. Follow the drinking gourd. Now you follow the river bank, makes a mighty good road. The dead trees will show you the ways. They point towards your rendezvous. And looking in the, in the ground, the dirt, the coal type markings distinctive marking prints that was made by the peg leg peg, uh, of peg leg Joe. Cause old left foot, peg foot's traveling on, just you follow the drinking gourd. Follow the drinking gourd. The old man is waiting to fall, carry you to freedom. Follow the drinking gourd. There are many individuals, husband and wife team, Will and, William and Ellen Kraft, who on December 18, 1848 disguised themselves as slave master and slave. William, the husband, was real dark and posed as a slave while his wife, Ellen, was so light that she could pass for white. She disguised herself as a man. And they disguised themselves as slave master and slave and journeyed their way, nearly getting caught. But on Christmas 1848, they arrived in their destination up north. A wonderful Christmas present indeed. From Georgia all the way up to Boston, it was said. Henry Box Brown had himself shipped and spent over 25 hours to freedom, packed and shipped in a crate, and with the help of underground network freedom uh, uh, secret agents, packed himself. It's like having yourself packed into a crate on a UPS or FedEx or, 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 or Amazon Prime uh, package. And when they opened it up, he said, how do you do, gentlemen? They said he was so wet from the sweat and the perspiration, he could literally drain out his shirt of sweat as deed. You couldn't be claustrophobic. Many individuals have did that after that as well, too. Henry Box Brown. Individuals by the name of John and uh, Mary Meacham. And Mary Meacham from Missouri was considered the Harriet Tubman of Missouri. Now there's a story how she risked her life. Her husband was an abolitionist. An abolitionist is anyone who fought and preached for the freedoms of individuals in this country there. Preached against slavery and its wrongs. There's a story how she was captured while helping to attempt to free fugitives from Missouri. 
to go across the Mississippi River to the free state of Illinois. A hero from Missouri, or should I say. She's a shero even today. The story begins in the city of St. Louis where slave codes enforced and lockdowns permitted. Nine fugitives seeking their freedom met in Mary's house for a secret meeting. Then we early in the morning, 1821, 1855, before the rising sun, nine fugitives paddled afloat across the Mississippi River, Mary in their boat. Freedom was their goal, danger was plight. Free State Illinois was in their sight. However, they were caught, arrested in hand with the Mary the Conductor, who took her stand. Risking on life on point was their leader. Shout her name and help me cheer her. Mary Meacham, an underground leader, conductor for freedom. Mary me John, an underground leader, and I've forgotten what she has done. Many of the codes that were used in the Underground Railroad and the who and the what were songs that were sung by the church. Couldn't hear nobody pray, which was illegal for African-American fugitives to meet together on the slave plantations. The slave master was thought you were trying to plot against escape, which they were, but you couldn't even meet together in the church unless a slave or a white preacher was present. So you met by yourselves or as a group after work at night down in the lower area in a grove of trees, the hush harbor by the river somewhere in a cave. And the next day, as you were make, after you had made your plans, Someone would come along as they're working along and sing the song. Couldn't hear nobody pray way down yonder by myself. Couldn't hear nobody pray. Code name, meaning no one got wind to the plan was going on. Many injuries in the things that were going on, like tools and techniques that were used. Quotes that were used to put upon that had secret maps that were quoted into the, the quilts, and the quilts were laid out over outside the windows or the, the fence posts, the fences and on the lines. And people will go up and read those maps. The flying geese pattern meant that this is the time where the geese, meaning there were the metaphors for the fleeing slaves, the freeing uh, the fugitives. Also, the monkey ridge pattern. That was the pattern when it was time to get right. Get right, church, it's praying time. Get right, church, it's praying time. Get right, church, it's praying time. Soon we're going home, which means get right because we're getting ready to go. Of course, Harriet Tubman, she too had a secret code name. Whenever you hear her, or maybe give a whistle, and you hear that song, way down in Egypt land, Tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. You know it was time to get on up there and meet the rendezvous, the secret agent, as they were going, as you were beginning to, to begin your journey. Usually you just carry nothing but the clothes in your back, the rags on your back. Nothing else but trusting your underground railroad conductor. You had many ways and techniques that were used. Candles or lanterns were to, in order to mark a station or a secret agent's house or a barn or somewhere that you will hide out. You put the candles somewhere or a lantern or a piece of clothing that was used to stretch out uh, on a door or a window. You know that was the secret house that was actually being broadcast on the black grapevine. That was basically no telephones, no computers, no way back then in the in 1800s. You just relied upon the telegraph game by word of mouth, trusting in your God and in the people that you put your life into for your freedom, the Underground Railroad Network conductors. Also, uh, there was another technique where you went to a station house. You may see a broom that's there. Someone will yell out, sweep the brown, sweep the porch, sweep the porch. You get up there and you're sweeping that porch. Sweep the porch, sweep the porch. Careful. Sweep the porch, sweep the porch. 
Come on inside here and sweep this room. Come on inside here and sweep this room. Because the Underground Railroad Network conductor will yell out, will recognize who you are as a fugitive for your freedom. And they will yell out those instructions. They had to pretend that you actually were a worker or a slave. And as you were sweeping, and then you come inside and swept, the door would close and lock, and you would go to a secret compartment or hide somewhere where you're safe as you continued your next journey. Indeed, and no one would knew. Of course, there were many terms that were used. The wagon wheel, of course, in the quote wheel, or the blazing sun quote pattern, indicates that you will prepare yourself for the summer escape. And I have retrieved these pictures from a book called Hidden in Plain View. Uh, and I believe the uh, compliments of the, of the M, uh, uh, MCPL, this library may have a copy of that as well, too. Uh, Hidden in Plain View by Jacqueline Tobin and Raymond Dover. It gives a wonderful uh, illustrations of the many quotes that uh, 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 Miss O'Daniels, a lady whose, whose ancestors were Underground Railroad conductors, actually used quilts as road maps and secret signal signs. And you would prepare yourself for the summer escape if you ever saw the wagon wheel or the blazing sun pattern. The many words that were used. We mentioned about soul down the river to Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, other points. Texas, there were points that slavery was really harsh. Someone would sold you down the river. That's what that means, that you were double-crossed. And actually, you were sold to a slave master or a plantation. An agent was a person who plotted the course of escape for the fugitive. The baggage was the uh, code name escaping slaves. The brakeman, code name, person in charge. Code name, conductors, people who directly, directly, direct, directly transported slaves, excuse me. Code name, drinking gourd, points to the North Star. Code name, the Freedom Line, the secret route for escaped slaves. Code name, the jumping off place, a place of shelter for fugitives. Schools were places of shelters. Churches were places of shelters. Anywhere an individual they were used to hide on the next journey towards their station to go for their freedom was used. Load of potatoes, code name, a wagon load of, of fugitives. Code name, operator, a person who aided fugitive slaves as a conductor agent on the Underground Railroad. Code name, paddy rollers. Those were the bounty hunters, another name for them. Code name, sanctuary, hiding place. We're going over to the sanctuary. Slave masters think you're going to church or somewhere or going to a place to pray. Didn't realize that you were going away to the hiding place. Code name, shepherds. Those are the individuals that were used to entice slaves, uh, individuals, fugitives to escape. I see my shepherd coming. Hmm. Code names, stations, the safe place where fugitives can be sheltered. Individuals had secret compartments in houses or used their businesses or attics or even secret compartments just like you would see on spy movies there and the doors would open up, a wall would open up and would lead down into a tunnel. A lot of these tunnels sometimes lead up there or into a creek or a river and that's where you travel to. You may also know some ancestors and know some places where they were used as stations along the Underground Railroad. You may even have some family members, some ancestors, that were actually were used as conductors on the UGRR. Lift every voice and sing to earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. There are many individuals dozens and dozens of landmarks and uh, museums that document the, the clandestine actions, the dangerous clandestine actions of the Underground Railroad, the who, what, 
and where did it go? And as we get into the where, let's explore some of these individuals that and places today that you may visit also that gives you a step back in time of that history and paints that picture of just what it was more all about there. Uh, William Steele, however, uh, he was a Underground Railroad conductor, helped 649 slaves receive their, their freedom. And in 1872, he published his conductor records of individuals that he helped rescue. He, he took their story down and he titled this book that he placed these stories into, titled simply, The Underground Railroad. William Steele. Uh, the first stop of freedom for escaping slaves uh, all along the Ohio River was of John Rankin's safe house in uh, Ripley, Ohio. He, along with his uh, wife and children, were one of the most active conductors along that route on the Underground Railroad. Now, by the way, uh, the Underground Railroad, it said it took its name uh, from a story uh, they said allegedly uh, about a, a fugitive by the name of Tice Davids. They said he was running along and the, the bounty hunters were after him. They had their old dogs <laughs> chasing after them, <laughs> sniffing them out. They said he jumped and leaped into the Ohio River, swam to the other side, made his way to the other side. And by the time they got to the riverbanks to look for him, <laughs> there he is, wait, what? he's gone. What do you mean he's gone? He just like he just disappeared into an underground road. It just swallowed him up. Now, and that was back in 1831 or so, the early 1830s, that where this word had kind of came out of that, this term underground. Now, or something secret. Now, there were some ways that were used, uh, you know, any, uh, you might may call it that, uh, underground caves. Uh, uh, but many, many different types of means and ways that people use uh, to gain their freedom, to gain, fugitives gain their freedom in this thing called the Underground Railroad. Wagons were used, horseback, carriage cabs, of uh, the, uh, the, the, any type of way that you would use to gain your freedom is that was actually used for that. Uh, the um, National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, was a uh, documents the loose network of anti-slavery and Northerners, and mostly individuals uh, and African Americans also too. Uh, free African Americans were used also. They used loyalized themselves and risked their lives to help people become free. Uh, and this is located in Cincinnati, Ohio, the Underground of uh, uh, National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. Uh, if you're somewhere down in Key West, the, uh, here's something you want to say that I had a, a little while back, got a chance to, to visit the Key West African Cemetery of 1860, a place called Higgs Beach, Beach in Key West, Florida, the African Cemetery at Higgs Beach. And this was a site that was documented in 1860. 294 African men and women and children who died in Key West in 1860. In the summer, that U.S. Navy uh, a vessel rescued 1,432 Africans from three American-owned ships engaged in the illegal slave trade. And they were bound for Cuba. However, they were intercepted by the U.S. naval vessel who brought the freed Africans to Key West where they were provided with clothing, shelter, and medical treatment. They had spent three weeks in unsanitary, inhuman conditions aboard those slave ships. And by August, more than 1,000 survivors left for Liberia, West Africa. The remainder there, who were succumbed by way of the harsh conditions and the disease and unsanitary conditions and the sickness, the ones that were, uh, were, uh, did not make that journey back to Liberia there. Well, some went on and moved on into the interior and lived as citizens in Florida and Key West and you know, other points. And the others, well, they were uh, given a, a burial in this uh, cemetery uh, called the African Cemetery Plaza in Key West, Florida. And uh, 
It's right on the west coast, uh, right on, uh, on the, the west side. I mean, on the, excuse me, on the east side of the Atlantic Ocean is where I like that. We're near, looking up the Atlantic Ocean and thousands and thousands of miles over on the other side is the continent of Africa. And we must remember the word Sankofa. Go back to fetch it. A reminder that the past must be a guide for the future. We must return to the source, retrieve and remember that what has been lost or forgotten in order to know that we, we know who we are and to make wise decisions and to be spiritually fulfilled. The Key West African Cemetery. Also, uh, the, uh, uh, one of the many prominent Beacon Hill uh, spots and the, uh, African, uh, uh, the African Meeting House, uh, the Boston African American uh, National Historic Site in Boston, Massachusetts. It's a, also, you can take a, a self-guided tour to see the first uh, uh, schoolhouse for African Americans and also where the area where the, the 54th Massachusetts walked and journeyed on that movie that was chronicled Glory. One of the, one of the first African American of, of regiments, fighting regiments, soldiers that were fought in the Civil War, they were allowed to fight there in Boston, Massachusetts there. You could actually journey through the different alleys as well and to see how it was if you were a person running down an alley and you turn a corner and then suddenly a door opens up, swings, and someone grabs you and pulls you inside. The door closes. Your captors turn the corner. It was like you disappeared. Where did you go? But you were swooped up by Underground Railroad Network secret agents. Also, we must not forget, right here in Kansas City, Missouri, the Black Archives of Mid-America. And the mission of the Black Archives of Mid-Americans of Kansas City is to collect, preserve, and make available to the public materials and documenting the social, economic, political, and cultural histories of persons of African-American descent in the central United States, which particularly emphasis in Kansas City, Missouri region. Black Archives of Mid-America is an educational resource and provides access to the collections for research, exhibition, and publication to honor our community heritage and to catalyze public awareness. It was founded on May 8, 1974 by Horace M. Peterson III, initially located in the historic uh, 1821 Paseo in the, in the, or the whole Paseo YMCA building, the historic uh, 18th Street Jazz District. And later on, it moved to the 18 to uh, the uh, uh, to 2033 Vine, which later on now it's present uh, behind the, the Negro Leagues Museum and the American Jazz Museum. And our final here, uh, a spot, and there's so many we can go on and on and on all day. But since we're running low on time here, can't forget the old Quindaro Museum at 3432 North 29th Street in KCK. Luther Smith is the director, and it was created by the new... Quindaro was a town, a unique town that was created for a safe and profitable passageway for individuals leaving the slaveholder states of Missouri into Kansas. And on the northeast side of Kansas City, Kansas, individuals would actually literally sometimes, if the, in, during the winter, would actually literally could walk across the ice from Missouri to Kansas. Walking into Quindaro. And from 1856 to 1862, and a little bit after the Civil War, this town was a, of the place that was an enterprise that was created by uh, white abolitionists, free African Americans, and uh, free uh, Wyandotte Native Americans. Quindaro was named after uh, a lady by the name of, uh, of Nancy, Nancy, of, of Guthrie, uh, and she, uh, her name was called, her Native American Wyandotte tribal name was called Sequindero, which simply means bundle of sticks or strength in unity. So the old Quindero Museum. And in closing, what does this all mean today? The Underground Railroad, that happened a long time ago, you may, uh, some maybe have this sentiment. And what has this got to do with me? Well, Chattel slavery, as we have explored for African Americans, may not be the type of chattel slavery that it was back then, uh, over 150 years ago. But there are still underground railroad operations still going on today. And there's still enslaved situations and circumstances that are still going on. 
This program is also to inspire you to be able to seek out and discover and find out and inspire you what can you do to help someone gain their freedom. Some other individual, other situations that be going on, well, the new slavery. This is a dated article uh, I have found. Uh, but the new slavery, one of those slave, uh, those slave uh, circumstances or situations could be human trafficking in, in America. The U.S. system to help and to find and helping victims. Some say it's broken. It can be fixed with your help utilizing your powers and skills to be a superhero to many, indeed. Do you know any underground railroads today? Anyone that's involved in the sex trade or the child endangerment trade or, or whatnot, which is a worldwide phenomenon? This is where you come in. And giving thanks to the Mid-Continent Public Library System, this is a good place to be able to start your research right here. Not only to find out more what can you do to help individuals become free, which could be your neighbors, but also discover yourself, your family, and perhaps someone that you may know could be one of those secret agents of the Underground Railroad. And this concludes the secret, the Underground Railroad, the who, what, and where did it go. My name is Brother John, motivational storyteller, cultural historian, and tribute vocalist, and I bid you peace and blessings and to continue be free to yourself so you can be free to others and help them be free as well.